how did we figure out that it goes from NADH to FMN to the iron sulfur centers to coenzyme two? How do we figure that out? Well, the way we did that is we used um, respiratory inhibitors. So what uh, probably graduate students did is they isolated mitochondria, which isn't too hard. They provided something that, the, um, that allowed electron transport to occur, and they added a molecule. And then they saw what built up. What, what species, what molecules built up? And if they built up, they knew, they knew that they were going to be connected. So let's take a look at that. They, they found three sites in which inhibitors had an effect. So this, is, this should be familiar to you, that first slide 15. This is what we took a look at, right? So you have the thing that has the electrons giving it to the thing that doesn't, ha that doesn't have the electrons. Now it has the electrons. Reacting with the next thing that doesn't have the electrons. Passes along. Now that has the electrons. So note that here, this reduced carrier that has the electrons is going to react with this oxidized carrier so that this carrier 3 now has it. You guys with me? So now, if I put something in that inhibits this reaction, then we're going to accumulate, get higher levels of both this one and this one. So if we stop this one reaction, this and this is going to get built up. Well, if they both get built up out of all the things in your, in your complex, then they must be associated together. Remember, this is reacting with this. So reduced carrier 2 is reacting with oxidized carrier 3 to produce oxidized carrier 2 and reduced carrier 3. That's a reaction. Reduced carrier 2 plus oxidized carrier 3 produces oxidized carrier 2 and reduced carrier 3. So it's carrier 3 carrier 3, carrier 2. If I stop this reaction from happening, then the reaction can't go forward. And what happens is the reactions happen up until this point, but they, it's, it's like damming up the waterfall. If you dam up the waterfall, then water behind the waterfall gets, it starts to accumulate. So if it's those two that accumulate, we know that this is going to react with this. So that's what's happening in this, um, in this way that we found that this carrier 2 and this carrier 3 were associated with each other. I think you guys all need IVs of caffeine. Rough weekend? Yeah? Is it only at destination? Or is it everywhere? Like everywhere? Is well, this, this one particular respiratory inhibitor only blocks this reaction. So only these would get accumulated. So this is what they found. They found that um, these are our inhibitors. So here, um, I don't think I would want to eat any of these or take in, that these molecules are blocking these, um, these sites. Um, that's why maybe carbon monoxide might not be so good. All right. Cyanide is also not a good thing to have around. And azide. I used to, does anybody <coughs> work in labs with azide anymore? Anybody? So when I would throw cells in like a shaker flask, we wouldn't want the water around the shaker flasks to get like gross things. We would put sodium azide in it. And I think that's frowned upon now. The things that I used to do that we no longer are able to do is quite amazing. So at each one of those inhibition sites, is that where more of this the reactants the accumulate. Reactants are accumulating? So then what happens? So you can't, what happens is you're not going to pass electrons along to oxygen. Right. You're not going to get the proton pumping. You're not going to make ATP. We've pumped protons through complex one, three, and four. Four protons, four protons, two protons. I do want you to know how many protons are pumped. Four protons, four protons, two protons. And four protons, four protons, and four protons, two protons. 
So it's pumping. Complex two does not. So that does not pump, uh, pump protons. What are we going to do with them? We've piled them up in the matrix. What are we going to do? So you guys probably have learned in other classes what we are going to do. But we are going to um, get those protons back. And by getting those protons back to the matrix, we are going to um, make ATP. The way we couple electron transport and the phosphorylation of ADP to make ATP is, called, is ATP synthase. A lollipop looking thing, which is another word is complex protein oligomer, that, um, that is separate from the electron transport chain complexes. It's something totally different, but they work together. So when we oxidize one NADH, we get two and a half ATPs. There's enough energy to make two and a half ATPs. When we oxidize an FADH2, we put that through complex two, we only get one and a half. Why do you think that there's this difference? Why is there a difference? Why don't we get our money back when we do the FADH2? Where, where do we, where do we uh, put FADH2 in? What complex? Two. Two. Yeah, and that's our weak one, right? That's the lame one. Complex two is lame, and so it's not pumping as much as many protons, so you're missing out on four of them, right? This one does only the four and two, and this does the four, four and two. So doesn't this make sense? Okay. More protons are pumped, fewer protons are pumped. So then that's why we don't get as many, so it's two and a half ATPs. One and a half ATP. So basically this PO is phosphorylation to oxidation. Two and a half phosphorylations of ADPs to one oxidation of the uh, NADH. Cool. So it's ATP synthase that's doing that work. Remember 442? Right? 442, I showed this before. I'm just showing this again. For every one NADH, four, four, and two. Protons. 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 Yeah, no. The electrons are the ones that are flowing. The things that are pumped are protons. I know that's confusing. Flowing electrons through the wire. The wire is our membrane. How about that? Electrons flow through the wire. The wire is our membrane. The protons are passing over the wire. <coughs> to make, okay, so the matrix is losing protons. So what about the pH here? Losing protons, more basic, it's going to be higher. The inner membrane space is gaining protons, so lower pH. Because higher protons, lower pH. This is electron transport. This box is electron transport. Pumps protons from the matrix into the inner membrane space. There is a osmotic pressure, chemi-osmotic pressure. Chemi-osmotic force, chemical and osmotic pressure, electrochemical force, driving it to go back. They want to get back, just like the water behind a dam. So what we've done is we poked a hole through the inner mitochondrial membrane that is the ATP synthase. There's only one way, if things are going well for you, that the protons can go back, and that's through the um, ATP synthase. This is what it looks like. It is some weird looking thing going on here. They go through here. Now, you have a bunch of protons going through here. What's going on with the pH inside this thing? As it flows flow through, it's going to become dense. Now, what do we say about the tertiary structure when you change pH? It changes. So we're using a change in pH to have a physical movement. This is really important. The change in pH as the protons are going through the ATP synthase. This is so exciting. Um, the change in pH as the, as the protons are going through the ATP synthase causes a physical movement in your ATP synthase. That physical movement 
causes or enables the phosphorylation of ATP or ADP to ATP. We're going to have some videos to show that. Sure. So the electron transport chain is pumping protons from the matrix to the inner membrane space. They need to get back. They need to get back. There's only one way, if you're having a good day, for they, those to get back, and that's through the ATP synthase. We're going to talk more about the ATP synthase in, in, in detail, but it can only get back one way. When protons are flowing through the ATP synthase, it's lowering the pH. When the, you lower the pH, you are changing tertiary structure. When you're changing tertiary structure, you're having physical movement. That physical movement enables ADP to be synthesized, um, ATP to be synthesized from ADP. We have two parts to ATP synthase, an F0, which acts as a spinning thing, and F1, where the um, enzymatic activity happens. So the F0, where the spinning happens, you can see over here, this is spinning and the F1 where the enzymatic activity happens. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what's happening. This is, uh, we're looking down at the F1 uh, portion. And the spinning of our F0, so imagine a lollipop and you're spinning a lollipop. The, the stick of your lollipop is the F0. The candy of your lollipop is the F1. So the enzymatic activity on the candy spinning on the, on the stick of your lollipop. And, they, and it does look like little lollipops along your inner membrane. And so we have three conformations. We have a loose, open, and taut or tight. So what happens is, let's take a look at the top. Loose, um, it binds your ADP and an inorganic phosphate. Then it changes to the tight, and that's when the magic happens. The tight binding, it closes and it causes ATP to be formed, and then when it gets to be open, which we're not showing here, that's when the ATP is released. <coughs> so the protons going through the F0 part sort of bumps these guys, and my video really shows it, um, to, to have it go from um, loose to tight to open. Actually, I think I have two videos that show this. I want to pause this just for a second. This blue part is, um, is that F naught. That's where the spinning is happening. That's, the spinning is happening because the protons are flowing through it, and so it's changing conformation. This, we're looking down at the lollipop head. We're looking down at the F, F, uh, um, F1. And so these are the three different um, subunits or, or dimers here that cause the ATP to be synthesized. All right, so here ADP and uh, phosphate come in, it closes to tight, and magic happens. <laughs> a little flash happens, and then it's going to change to open, and the ATP comes out. And so it's happening in three different parts. So you can have, there's three different areas that it can happen in. And go back. So here there's um, pink and yellow, pink and yellow, pink and yellow. So it's the pink and yellow that work together. And notice as the F1 or F0 is spinning around, it's, it's like bumping into the um, F1 portions. And causing them to change their conformation from um, loose to tight to open. Yes, Aaron? Did you say ADP is flowing in? Yeah. So what we, we have here, all right, so ADP 
came out, let's see if we're showing. No, let me, let me back up even more. All right, ADP and, and phosphate went in tight. The flash is ATP being synthesized and it goes out. In the loose, the ADP and the inorganic phosphate come in. Then it goes to the tight. That's where the ADP and the phosphate make our ATP. <coughs> That's where the flash in my video shows up. And then it's the open, and that's where the ATP can come out. Yes, here. Where are the protons involved? The protons are involved in, we're not seeing it here, but the protons are involved in turning, right here, let me show you. Um, so here, this is the F0 portion, and this is the um, F1. The last video, we were looking down on top of the lollipop. This is the stick of the lollipop, and this is the top of the lollipop. So this is where the catalytic, or the pink and the yellow ones were. We were watching where the, where the loose, tight, and open. The protons are getting, this is the membrane right here, and this is the inner membrane space right down here. The protons are flowing through this F, F naught portion, flowing through this, and it actually moves. See how that's spinning? That's what the protons are causing, the spinning of our F naught. That's spinning. See how it's bumping in to our F1 portion, the head of the lollipop? That's causing the different conformations. You can see <coughs> that as as this is spinning, it's changing the shape. So we see flying in our ADP and phosphate flying out after the flash, and it doesn't really flash in your mitochondria. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? We all have little flashes. Um, the ATP is coming out. So if for whatever reason there is an inhibition of the flow of the protons. Yeah, you wouldn't have this going on? Wouldn't. So even so there's two ways of the conformational change, then you need the protons and the so, ADP? No. Binding? The conformation changes only because. Only because of the protons? Oh, the protons. Which, oh, okay, so then Which that allows, allows the binding of the yes. ADP and the phosphates? And the, it allows it to go from loose, tight, to open. The flow of electrons causes, the flow of the protons causes the, the change from loose, tight, to open. Look how beautiful this is. I know it's not color, but that's spinning, causing that spinning, causing this to change, allowing us to make ATP. And then the ATP can be used to run away from bears. That's, this is beautiful, guys. This is like, to me, the highest point of the semester. This video right here. This video right here is the highest point of the semester because it's putting together so much. It's putting together our enzymatic activity. It's putting together pH. It's putting together a structure of our proteins. It's, it's putting everything together. So this is, let's just watch this a little bit more. Look at that. Yes, Amanda. So the spinning occurs because of the pH change? Yes. The spinning occurs because we are changing the pH inside here. And when you change pH, you change tertiary structure. There's another group of compounds called uncouplers. You still have electron transport chain happening. Oxygen still has the electrons. However, you do not form ATP as a result. So what we are with uncouplers, they are foreign materials, not natural materials, that unlink electron transport and ATP synthesis. So what happens is you still have the proton pumping, but your ATP is not made. We are very happy to live in the times that we do because in 
the beginning of last, bless you, the beginning of last century, um, people were sold materials that um, weren't so good. 2,4-dinitrophenol is a um, drug that was sold for weight loss. And it caused people to lose weight because they died. Um, they died because it was a small molecule that, was, that could carry the protons back across to the matrix without going through ATP synthase. Let me say that again. Uncouplers work in a way that allow the protons to not to go back to the matrix without going through ATP synthase. It's like poking a hole in your um, dam and not, not and providing a different way for the water to get through and not go through the turbine to make the energy. Yes, Patrick. It's actually come back as a bodybuilding drug. It's come back as a bodybuilding drug. People are real stupid about it. So. Yeah, I would. I would never go into GNC and take any of that stuff. Well, most of the stuff there is underdosed, at least. So this is like uh, people buying legally online. Yeah, you. They. This is. This is a. Po it's a poison. So you're not. So maybe you're. You're uh, taking. You're uncoupling. This. So you're not making energy from the food that you're eating. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's a weight. It's basically a weight loss drug. So what's happening is it's print, picking up the protons and carrying it through. So this 2,4-dinitrophenol can get through the membrane. Protons cannot, but it allows it to go through the membrane. Yeah. You talked about like FDA stuff before. Like, do they regulate any of that? Like, nope. no. No, they don't do internet stuff. They don't regulate anything. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> cause cause several deaths to the liver failure. Yeah. Another uncoupler is called an inophore, which actually just, it seriously pokes another hole through the membrane. This is, this is like a physical hole. So gramocidin A is, um, it's used um, as inhibiting um, bacteria. And what it, how it does is it dissipates the proton gradient. So now, instead of going through ATP synthase, you can just go through this hole. So either you can have a molecule that picks up the electrons and can go through, or you have a physical hole through an ionophore. So a, a shuttle mechanism is one in which gets molecules um, from where they normally are to where they, you want to get them, but they can't normally cross the membrane. So let's think about this for a moment. Do we want NADH to be permeable to the mitochondrial membrane? Do we want NADH to be able to go in and out? No, because what would happen if NADH could, could come out? You wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't have electron transport. So we need to make sure that NADH stays in the mitochondria so that it can participate in the electron transport chain. Can you think of... NADH that we've talked about a couple chapters ago that is not in the mitochondrial, uh, in, the, in the mitochondria. The cytosol from what process? Glycolysis. We're not going to waste it. So what we need to do is get it into the matrix somehow so that it can participate in the electron transport chain. So that's what we're going to talk about. How do we get the cytosolic NADH the NADH from our uh, glycolysis into the matrix so that it can contribute to um, in, into our electron transport chain. There's two. There's the glycerol phosphate shuttle and there's the malate aspartate shuttle. And one is better than the other. One has a better, what I call, exchange rate. So the glycerol phosphate shuttle takes NADH from um, what we're 
making it in glycolysis. How many do you get from glycolysis for every molecule of glucose? Two. Two, because you get one from each um, stage two, right? So we get two of them. All right, so we get two. And each one, through this glycerol phosphate shuttle, will only make one and a half ATP. All right, let's think about this for a second. What did I say about the PO ratio or that exchange rate when I put NADH into the electron transport chain? How many ATPs can we make? 2.5. So we're kind of getting not a good exchange rate here. This isn't such a good deal. What molecule only makes one and a half ATPs? FADH2. FADH2. Somebody's been studying. So FADH2 only makes one and a half. So what can you think happens to that NADH? Does it get transferred back to an NADH? When we have the NADH in the cytosol, do you think it gets transferred back to an NADH in the matrix? What do you think is going to happen? Maybe those electrons don't get transferred back to an NADH in the, in the matrix. What do you think it's going to get transferred back to? FADH2. So you guys already know this. By me telling you that there was only a, an exchange rate of one and a half ATPs, you knowing what the exchange rate for FADH2 is, and the, the real word, word is uh, PO ratio, phosphorylation to oxidation ratio, but I call it exchange rate. Um, what that exchange rate is for FADH2, you already know what's happening for the glycerol phosphate shuttle. You take the NADH, you're going to give the electrons from the NADH, remember, when I'm saying NADH, that's NAD with electrons. That H is a hydride. The hydride is the holder of the electrons. So you're going to give the electrons from the NADH to other molecules. When those other molecules that can pass through the membrane are going to pass off the electrons to, um, to something in the matrix, it's not going to pass it back to another NADH. It's going to pass it back to an FADH2. So let's see how that happens. You're not going to have to memorize this, okay? Um, what I want you to remember is basically what I've already said, is that the, any, the electrons from uh, the uh, glycolysis NADH get passed through all right, glycerol phosphate. That's why it's glycerol phosphate. So remember the name and the exchange rate. It gets transferred to glycerol phosphate, which can pass through the membrane. Then once it's in the matrix, it gets passed to FADH2. So all you have to remember for the glycerol phosphate shuttle is the name, glycerol phosphate shuttle, right? And that it starts out with the gly uh, glycolysis NADH. Those electrons get passed to the name, glycerol phosphate. Glycerol phosphate can make it through the, both membranes. And then once it's glycerol phosphate's in the matrix, it passes it to FADH2. That's what I want you to remember. Sure. Let me answer uh, Alex's question first. Okay. Um, does it have to use FADH in order to get it off because it's harder to pull off? Um, it has to. It, in this case, it uses FADH2. I, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why. I, remember I said, oh, you're going to see FADH2 when you're putting a double bond in. I'm not sure. I haven't investigated this. So it is sort of surprising that we're using an FADH2 for this or an FAD to oxidize it back. It might be that it is harder to oxidize this one, but it might be just the way it is. Yeah, I'm not sure why. I don't have that answer. But that's good thinking. You're, you were surprised that we were, we were, Alex was surprised that when we were oxidizing this OH to get back to our, um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, that um, what happened was we were oxidizing an OH, and usually we use NAD for that. But here we're using an FAD. So that was surprising because what I told you, when you see FAD as an oxidizing agent, you're going to see it putting in a double bond. Here, this is not the case. I'm not sure why it's using FADH2 or FAD to oxidizing. All right, so again, one more time. What's happening is that we have the reverse of the reaction that happens in glycolysis. The, the one um, 
that, so what we're doing is we're taking NADH and we are oxidizing it to NAD. We're giving the electrons to glycerol phosphate. Glycerol phosphate is permeable to both the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes. Once inside the matrix, the glycerol phosphate gives the electrons to FAD to make FADH2. The FADH2 enters the electron transport chain and only makes one and a half ATPs. So when you're condensing your notes, the way you should condense it is saying glycerol phosphate shuttle, underlying glycerol phosphate, say this is the molecule that gets across the membrane, and then NADH to FADH2. That's how I would condense it. The other um, shuttle is the malate aspartate shuttle. Um, we don't have that as widespread as the um, glycerol phosphate shuttle, but it's found in um, kidney, liver, and heart, and it's much more um, efficient because the NADH, it's, uh, the electrons from NADH is transferred to another NADH in the matrix. It's a little bit more complex um, than the uh, glycerol phosphate shuttle, um, but really what I want you to remember is that um, the malate is going to cross the, um, uh, the membrane. So again, we're going to, because we're transferring it from a cytosolic NADH to a mitochondrial NADH, we get an exchange rate of two and a half. So here, this is what's happening. Malate can get through, so the names are the, are the mole, is the molecule that is going to get across the membrane. Here we, we're talking about both of them. So the malate is what's going to pick up the electrons from the NADH and cross the membrane. Here we're going to um, then, once we're in the, um, the matrix, we're going to pass it back to NADH. That's really what I want you to remember. That um, we're going to transfer the electrons to malate. Malate is permeable to the membrane. And then um, once the malate is in the matrix, it passes it back to NADH. But I want to talk about it a little bit more. Um, in glycolysis, the reaction that, one of the reactions that produces NADH, um, or the reaction that produces NADH is, um, or the last one, I'm sorry, uh, is going from malate to oxaloacetate, right? That oxidation. So we're reducing NAD to NADH. So we're running that reaction in reverse here, going from oxaloacetate to malate. So that's a reduction, so we're oxidizing the NADH. So this is, this is the reaction from glycolysis running it in reverse. I'm not going to. Citric acid cycle that is running in reverse. But it's happening in, um, in, in the cytosol. So we have a different uh, a cytosolic enzyme. So we're running it in reverse. We let the malate cross the membrane. The malate then runs it in the forward direction to have the oxidation. And so we're reducing the NAD. We then take the oxaloacetate and um, we transfer a group and we make aspartate that can go back out. I don't really need you guys to remember that part. It's part of the name, so that's why I need you to remember it. But really, malate crosses the membrane, NADH to NADH. Fair enough? Any questions? Are you awake? Yeah? It's too sunny out not to be awake, right? OK. Um, I'd like to complete our story of our metabolism from glucose. So we're done now talking about metabolism of glucose.
So we're going to do sort of an accounting. And um, what we have here, this is right from your textbook, is um, the different things that are going on. So here we have glycolysis, and these are different, the different reactions that either use up ATP or produce NADH or FADH or NADH here. And here, this is the pre-citric acid cycle. This is the citric acid cycle. And then this is the exchanging of everything that we've made. Now, we have sort of a two, two accounting here. The reason why we have two accountings here is based on the shuttle. So what I'm going to do is sort of focus on the glycerol phosphate shuttle first and then um, talk about things later. So let's focus on glycolysis here, this top one. We, um, this is ATP, we use up an ATP. So just put your hand over this one right now. We're not going to pay attention to this. So this is sort of like, let's, um, let's focus just on this. This is if we use the malaspartate shuttle. So if we phosphorylate glucose, we're going to use up an ATP. So negative one. We phosphorylate again to um, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So now we're, we're in the hole too. We're paid our college tuition. Now let's make some money, right? Here, we um, make an ATP, all right? That's one step, but remember this happened, this is stage two, so this happens in, um, in um, duplicate, so we're gonna make two, now we're even. We paid off your student loans. And then, happens pretty quickly, you went, you went to community college like that, so you pay off the student loans quickly. And then, remember, we make, um, when we, we uh, take PEP and make pyruvate, we make our net too. Then we also have the NADH that we make um, when we oxidize the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So here, the NADH, we get two of those as well because it's happening in duplicate. So, um, here we're, we're exchanging that. The pre-citric acid cycle, because remember it's happening in duplicate, we're putting two pyruvates through. So we get two NADHs. Because each time we do, we put a pyruvate through the pre-citric acid cycle, we get one NADH. So here is our net of two. <clears throat> now let's talk about the citric acid cycle. We get two molecules of GTP. We're going to count that as two ATPs because that phosphate can be just transferred to ATP. So we're going to net two. And then we get, um, because we oxidize um, isocitrate and alpha glutarate and malate, we get three NADHs from our um, citric acid cycle. But remember, this is happening in duplicate because we started out with two molecules of pyruvate. So everything is happening in duplicate. So we get a net for every molecule of glucose that we started with, we get six NADHs. We get one FADH2 for every citric acid cycle. So again, in duplicate, we get plus two. So here, what we've started with is we have a net, a negative two, or not a net, we, we're negative two, we add two, add two, NADH, NADHs, more ATPs, and uh, more NADH. <coughs> so now what we're going to talk about is taking these NADHs and these FADH2s and exchanging them into our, um, exchanging them into electron transport to make ATPs. So these two NADHs we just talked about, they're in the cytosol. So they have to go through our, um, our shuttles. If we use the glycerol phosphate shuttle, the two NADHs will make how many ATPs? Three, right, it's right here. Because each one is one and a half. One and a half times two is three. Now, if we use the malate aspartate shuttle, two NADHs will make five. So that's where the two lines come from, guys. So that's five. All right, now this is in the mitochondria, so the two NADHs will make five. ATPs, because two and a half times two is five. And then we're talking about the FADH2. Two FADH2s will make three. 
the six NADHs, six times two and a half is 15. So if we use the glycerol phosphate shuttle, we have two fewer ATPs than if we use the malleated aspartate shuttle. So depending on what shuttle you use, you're going to use either, you're going to net for every molecule of glucose either 30 or 32 ATPs. That's a lot. From here down, you need oxygen. So all of this down here, this, all these, these goodies that we made here are from having oxygen. The ATPs, if you're anaerobic, are only from the two that we get up here. So that's quite a difference. Having oxygen around definitely makes it more um, efficient use of, uh, of your energy. Any questions? I'm not going to ask you to do an accounting. I would ask you specific questions about this. How many do you get from glycolysis? How many, you know, what is the ratio of turning an NADH in? What is the difference in using the different shuttles? So that, you know, I'm not going to have you do this accounting again.